This rocket is not lifting off from Kennedy Space Center, and it wasn't designed by engineers for NASA. It was home-built in a garage. But on board some of these rockets are experiments from young engineers who will help to build the next generation of spacecraft. And the lessons they learn here will help to prepare them for what lies ahead. This is Arlis, a rocket launch for international student satellites. Well, it just seemed like a really good program, uh, working with university students, engineering students, aerospace students. Jonathan DuBose has come to this dry lake bed in Nevada to help engineering students put their ideas and inventions to the test. Santa Clara University in California's Silicon Valley. Three of those young engineers, Karen, Lauren, and Francis, are working on a project for NASA. This is our optical system. It's a small, so low-cost nephilometer, a new tool for measuring and air pollution. So this, this is one big test for us. We actually get to go out into a, a desert or a place where it is very dusty. It is dusty on Nevada's Black Rock Desert, but dust is not why they've come here. Students from Montana State University have built a magnetometer. Before it flies in space, they'll fly it on a rocket over Black Rock. Well, I want to check the parachute. Um, eventually, this magnetometer will go on a satellite and help with attitude control. So as a satellite spinning around the Earth, it can maintain one orientation as it moves around. So this is a uh, more of a test run for the technology to make sure it'll work. Right now, I'm just trying to keep track of everything. Um, I'm pretty relaxed. Uh, I don't get nervous until it gets on the pad. Tom Kearns belongs to a group of high-power rocketeers who launch dozens of these science payloads every year on their home-built rockets. Your project's not beeping. It's not beeping. I just hope it doesn't, I don't screw it up somehow, you know. I like to bring my stuff back, like to bring their stuff back. And try, just try not to blow it up. It's a great opportunity for us to prototype uh, our equipment at a low-cost mode before we actually put it on a satellite and spend uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to launch it into space. Once we fly it into space, there's no going up with a monkey wrench or a soldering iron and fixing things. The student payloads will not fly to space on these rockets, but it will prove whether their experiments can survive the G-forces of launch and gather science data as they descend to Earth under parachute. And then I also have a GPS that is now reporting data too. It'll tell me where it's at. And we thought, why not? I mean, I thought we thought it would be a great opportunity to test any of our sensors. There's a combination of having to build a very complex project and flying it in a high power rocket to two miles high, but also the, doing it here in this unique place of, of Black Rock which is an incredibly hostile environment. It's gorgeous, but it's hostile. And trying to do a complex project with programming and electronics at the last minute and things fail and you discover things, that whole process of failure and recovery and failure and recovery to success is an astonishing experience, life experience. Jonathan is getting ready to launch his newest high power rocket on its first flight. The rocket won't carry a science experiment until it passes a test flight and a checkout of the onboard computer that fires ejection charges and deploys the parachutes. Okay. Uh, I always envied engineers and people who are good at math, because I wasn't. So I like hanging around with people like that. I, I, I learn a little bit here and there. That'll deploy his parachute, hopefully at the right time. A successful flight. Jonathan's rocket is now cleared to launch student payloads. Well, I'm going to take off and go chase these guys. Oh, 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 oh. I see them, all three of them. There's no other program quite like Arliss. Engineering students from around the world come here every summer to launch their science experiments and miniature satellites, CANSATs, on board home-built right rockets. 
Arliss was started in 1999 by an engineering professor at Stanford University and members of Aeropac, a high-power rocketry club in Northern California. In the first 10 years of Arliss, they've logged more than 250 rocket launches and helped to launch the careers of a new generation of aerospace engineers. I just think it's a really good program. For example, the Japanese students that have come over and been part of Arliss, I think there's a bunch of them working on the Japanese space program. It's been astonishing. I mean, we started with, uh, you know, what, three, four schools in 1999, and, you know, uh, this fall, this year, we're actually going to think about we're going to do probably close to 25. And uh, we have this, you know, just astonishing record of flying these really big rockets on these really big motors with very complex projects. Uh, there we go. Uh, one of the things that impressed me was when the Japanese came last year, they talked about their 10 years in the program. And they point out that over 1,000 engineers have been trained that are now in the aerospace industry building aerospace products in Japan. And there are over 10 satellites in orbit that have been worked on by engineers that have come out of this program. It's a program made possible by men and women whose passion is building and flying high-power rockets. Going in five, four, three, two, one. Come on, Maine. That was, that was very tense. That was the uh, most complex rocket I ever did. My favorite thing is I'm able to go in my garage and take cardboard and fiberglass and some epoxy and come out here and launch something over mock that can hit, uh, you know, the last one my recorded speed was 856 miles an hour and bring it home in one piece. And to me, that's really, really cool to be able to do that. This is my Magnum and uh, I flew it on a Ceceroni uh, J295, and I air started uh, two H97s. Both the air starts lit, and uh, the new parachute worked great, lowered it to the ground real gently, no damage. A few thousand people in the U.S. are active in the sport of high power rocketry. They're tested and certified through a national rocketry organization called Tripoli. First time here, it's awesome. It's like a great place to fly. So looking forward, I dro drove a long way from San Diego, uh, 599 miles. Many of these rockets will fly miles high. A waiver from the FAA clears the airspace and allows flights up to 96,000 feet. There we go. All right. We got a couple of parts out on the range, but they're all safely away. Oh, this is, I've launched this rocket about 20, 25 times and had M's in here, but uh, this is a much peppier M than I've ever put in it and I just couldn't stand the, uh, the stress. So it came apart in flight. M is a category of high power rocket motor. The motors burn the same propellant as the solid rocket boosters on the space shuttle. Arliss rockets can carry payloads two miles high and fly many times over. We've never lost a CANSAT, and we've lost some rockets after they've successfully deployed their CANSATs, because um, rocketry is that kind of thing. But in general, we have an astonishing safety record for flying big for these big motors. We've never had a motor problem. Uh, we've never uh, failed to get off the pad, and um, we've never failed to deliver a payload. Now, some of those payloads haven't always landed properly, but that's an experience. That's part of the experience. Right? We're going to put you up in this one. It's my more experienced vehicle. Jonathan will launch the science experiment for the students from Santa Clara University. The nephilometer will measure particulates in the air as it floats back to Earth. The experiment is carefully loaded into Jonathan's rocket. Too tight, the payload gets stuck and the rocket crashes. Too loose, and the nose cone comes off in flight and the airframe is shredded. The entire flight will last only a matter of minutes, but a lot will have to go right for it to be a success. Yeah, let's put your name on there. It's customary, perhaps even a bit of good luck, for the students to sign their names to the rocket before launch. <laughs> and a good way to relieve the tension, students carry the rocket out to the launch pad. It's about 47 pounds. All right, we're going to spice things up a little bit. We got our first grapple drawing to launch here. I mean, this kind of marks our final event with this project. 
so it's kind of cool that we get to launch it. Yep. Ready to turn it over to the next team and hopefully get some good stuff out of this. <laughs> Small nephilometers like the one that's going up in this rocket will eventually be flown under weather balloons and used to study air pollution. Some of these science projects involve years of designing, building, and testing. But the experiment is only coming back in one piece if the altimeter, ejection charges, and parachutes on the rocket work properly. Once the motor ignites, there's no shutting it down. It looks like another good flight. I see an event. I see a first shoot. Yes. You see one shoot on that? There it is. One. I don't know. I assume the payload came out because we had a nose cone. Oh, jeez. Is ours going to come crashing down? That's the fan can. So it's coming down a little fast, or maybe it's tangled. Part of the rocket is falling fast, and there's no sign of the science experiment. Yeah, For several minutes, there. it appears something a, has no, gone no, wrong. I see small shoots. There's something coming down here. Out of the blue, the nephilometer descending safely under its own parachute. No damage at all, pretty much. We have to run it through a couple of different conversions and, and see what the numbers tell us. I could load this thing up and fly it again right now. But flying will have to wait. A dust storm and 60 mile an hour winds make a direct hit on the flight line. There's a scramble to keep tents and equipment from blowing across the lake bed. No, I come out here all the time. This is how you that storm. Weather can change quickly on the high desert playa, but the dust clears and the launch resumes. The team from Montana State University is now ready to fly their magnetometer. Students have worked three years on this project. We won't tether it. It's now in the hands of veteran Arliss flyer, Paul Hopkins. Because there is a little gap there, and then I got a little shear pin that goes in there. So that's, that's beautiful. Paul, like all of the Arliss flyers, is well aware of the hard work students put into this experiment. I keep going over my head. Did I do everything, all the checklist? Because um, we definitely want a successful launch every time for the students. Student teams pay between $150 and $400 to fly a payload, depending on the size of the rocket motor. Arliss is open to any university, high school, or even middle school that wants to fly a science experiment. Going up on Paul's rocket is a real piece of spaceflight hardware. It's pretty interesting. Eventually this magnetometer is going to go into a nanosat in orbit, and it'll be used for the attitude control system there uh, to help align the satellite with the Earth's magnetic field using three uh, electromagnetic coils. Three, two, one. Holy cow. Yeah, that's why we laid out the I have no eyeballs on that one. The rocket and payload are nearly out of sight. Only a trail of smoke is visible. The magnetometer is actually staying aloft longer than expected. You got too big of a shoot. Yeah, we got about a 45. Well, yeah. <laughs> you may want to make it a little smaller, but that's okay. But it's one more successful Arliss launch. The record of never losing a payload to rocket failure is still intact. Paul recovered the magnetometer on the plane. The science data from both of these launches will be used to develop two new aerospace technologies. One device to study air pollution, the other to maneuver small satellites in space. And the students who designed them join a growing number of engineers around the world whose first satellite was a CANSAT and first launch on a home-built rocket.